On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about NASA going back to the moon. Plus, Curtis talks about Marie Kondo being your cybersecurity guru. Plus, we have a great guest while Curtis, Brian, and I talk with Erica Brescia from Bitnami about the future of Kubernetes. Twyla on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 335, recorded March 29th, 2019. Put it in a container and wrap it with a bow. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Wasabi's disruptive cloud storage technology is helping enterprises solve one of their fastest growing issues, data storage. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com. Click free trial and use the offer code ENTERPRISE. And by WordPress. Turn your dreams into reality and launch your website at WordPress.com. Get 15% off any new plan at WordPress.com slash twit. And by Sophos Cybersecurity. In an age of evolving cyber threats, you need evolved cybersecurity. Powered by artificial intelligence, Sophos can detect threats before they strike, killing ransomware, viruses, and other cyber threats dead in their tracks. Get a free security scan and or free trial today at Sophos.com. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need help from some of the top enterprise tech professionals in the industry and the brains of this alpha, starting out with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, uh, welcome back. Thank you so much. It's it's great to be here um, sitting in Florida while my colleagues are scattered around the world. Uh, but I'm happy to be sitting uh, in my own little studio, in my own little swamp, enjoying another hour with the Twyat Riot. Now, being the senior editor at Dark Reading, you tend to write about a lot of interesting stuff. But one thing I don't know if you realize is you just recently wrote about NDSU setting up a uh, and offering a cybersecurity PhD, and that was actually one of my alma maters uh, when I went and got my software engineering master's. What what kind of led you to, to to writing about that? Interestingly enough, and I'll be talking more about this in in just a few minutes. Um, we get press releases from all kinds of of educational uh, institutions as well as companies and government agencies, and this one uh, they have the very first program of this sort. Uh, we'll there tease it just a little bit, but uh, it's something new. It, it's looking at a, a problem that is much discussed uh, and very apparent in the enterprise security arena. They're looking at a solution from a slightly different angle than most people are, and I, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Fantastic, fantastic. I'd love to hear about it. Well, of course, we can't forget our very own geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, uh, you're doing some stretching there? It is the MacGyver School of Engineering. <laughs> fantastic, Actually, fantastic. it's part of my uh, soap, latest soapbox. It, uh, for some reason or not, I've never understood, but the um, ratings people don't count you as a viewer if you record it or if you're a cord cutter. It's only if you watch the program live. And so I'm wearing the shirt in honor of hoping that one of my favorite shows, MacGyver, gets renewed. Um, because we all need to see STEM even in our entertainment, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you're, do you're doing a bunch of work on your house getting it ready for something, right? Yes, um... We are, well, I'm actually getting very close to retiring, and I'm hoping to join Curtis in the swamp. Um, so I've been doing a lot of plumbing, you know, rebuilding faucets, uh, toilets, fun stuff like that. Um, also doing <laughs> some stuff with the central vacuum. I tell you, central vacuums rock my world. They are awesome. 
but they, they are, are a pain awesome. unless you do it when you build the house. Yep, yep, yep. Fantastic. Well, folks, we're not going to be talking about fixing toilets today, but we are going to be talking about some pretty amazing things like NASA trying to return to the moon, the Intel tax, and more. Plus, we have a really great guest, Erica Brescia, from co-founder and CEO of Bitnami, to talk about the future of Kubernetes and organizations and how they're transitioning to the cloud. But before we get into all that goodness, let's go ahead and jump into this week's blips. Well, the Turing Award is like the Nobel Prize of Computing. If you don't remember this award, it's named after the British mathematician Alan Turing, who laid the foundations for computer science. Actually, if you want a good movie for this weekend, go check out The Imitation Game with Benedict Cumberbatch. Good, pretty good movie. The first, now, the first of this award was back in 1966, and it won now. Uh, if you won now, you'd be with the likes of Donald Knuth, Kenneth Iverson, Alan Kay, and others. And over the last couple of years, winners of this award focused on areas of computer architecture. Architecture, also awarding Tim Berners-Lee for inventing the first web browser and for those who provided contributions to modern crypt cryptography. Now, all noble contribution to the field, but my guess is you also see a trend in these topics. They are mostly topics that focus on the technology trends of our time. Such topics as miniaturizing and scaling computer architectures, enhanced web browsers, and crypto support. Now, I bet you can guess the next topic for this past year's winner. That's right. AI. I'm going to try to get these names right. You have Yashua Benjigo or Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun, sometimes called the godfathers of AI. Now, have you recognized uh, this? You actually see that they'll get a $1 million annual prize for their work on conceptual engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks and critical components of computing. Now, if you are in the field, you most likely have come across algorithms from these masters in their area, such as facial recognition systems that unlock your phone to AI language models that suggest what to write in your last email. Now, although each of these award winners have contributed a great amount to their field, all of them agree that there's a lot more work required before AI lives up to its promises. As Jan LeCun says, there's probably another 50 mountains to climb, and we've only climbed, climbed the first one. Well, there's a new tool from Shodan that helps organizations figure out their internet exposed devices. Shodan, the IoT search engine famous for telling hackers where their targets live, this week rolled out a service that helps solve the underlying problem its tool exposes. The Shodan monitor will alert organizations to devices left exposed on the public internet. Security researchers long have employed the Shodan research tool to identify computers, databases, industrial control systems, and devices, as well as consumer IoT products that are sitting wide open to attackers via open internet ports or other misconfigurations. Uh, in a recent example, a researcher discovered a MongoDB data instance with 150 gigs of get data, including some 763 million email addresses that were sitting on the public net and in plain text. Shodan Monitor, which is available free to all Shodan subscribers, represents a brand new tool for Shodan. It's an, inter it's an online continuous monitoring service, and setting it up should take less than a minute. Now, once you have it set up, Shodan will send you an email when it finds an exposed device. <clears throat> for Shodan members, it monitors up to 16 IPs and for Shodan corporate API members, that goes up to 300,000 IPs. The Shodan spokesman says that Monitor was built to be simple and inexpensive and a tool for organizations with less technical know-how and resources. For everyone, it's a great window into the same sort of view that your attackers have. So the headline on this article is basically how Microsoft found a Huawei driver that opens systems to attack. Now, as much as I hesitate um, using Huawei equipment, I've got to ask people to take this with a bit of salt. So the Huawei MateBook systems that are running the company's PC manager software included a driver that would let unprivileged users create processor, processes with super user privileges. Sounds bad, doesn't it? Mm. The insecure driver was discovered by Microsoft using some of the new monitoring features added to Windows version 1809 
that are monitored by the company's Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection, ATP, service. First things first, Huawei did fix the driver and published the safe version in early January. So if you're using a Huawei system and have either updated everything or removed the built-in applications entirely, you're good to go. Now, the interesting part of the story is how Microsoft found the bad driver in the first place. Microsoft Defender ATP does not rely solely on signature-based endpoint anti-malware to detect known threats. It also uses heuristics that look for behavior that appears suspicious. Even if no particular malware has been identified, Windows itself notices certain actions taken by software, reports them to the Defender ATP cloud service, and machine-learned based algorithms look for anomalies in these reports. So... Let's summarize. This is a case of whether it's a feature or a flaw in that this particular driver is using a feature that looks very much like a double backdoor hack to automatically restart certain pieces of the OS suite if it detects something wrong. The same feature that hackers are using to gain remote access to systems. So Huawei did patch this feature back in January but this starts to point out that it's starting to become a lot harder to tell features from flaws. Now, if you thought the microprocessor competition was starting to slow down and trend down, AMD has come to the ring with their fighting stance ready. Now, in a recent white paper by AMD titled Avoid the Intel Tax with AMD Epic Processors, AMD is ready to throw some punches. Now, what is the actual Intel tax? Well, as described by the paper, it's the extra price for Intel processors that you have to pay already to get the features and performance you need because Intel's server line is filled with self-imposed designed-in performance bottlenecks that affect real-world results. Now, it's a different type of campaign to actually name a competitor during an obvious marketing ploy to get organizations to focus more on AMD's Epic processors, but AMD is not alone in this old game of adversaries. Intel published a blog post by the Mobileye CEO in which he repeatedly said that NVIDIA's safety force field autonomous driving tech imitates his company's responsibility sensitivity tech safety system. Now, the age of sterilizing comments before making them public might be in the time of the past. Let the competition finally begin. Hey, ever want to teach cybersecurity? North Dakota State University has a program for you. You heard us refer to this at the beginning of the show when we found out that our very own Louis Maresca is an alum of NDSU. And it's really interesting because solutions to the cybersecurity skill shortage have tended to focus on the people who need training. But a new program from NDSU tackles the issue from a different direction. It's offering a focus on cybersecurity education within its computer science PhD program. The goal of the program, according to the university statement, is to produce more university-level instructors qualified to teach courses in bachelor's and master's degree programs. The university states, quote, students get a strong background in core computing concepts, software development, databases, algorithms, and artificial intelligence, as well as completing coursework in key cybersecurity areas and educational methods in research, end quote. Dissertations in the program can be based on research in cybersecurity, <clears throat> cybersecurity education technology, and cybersecurity education research. Now, the first student has already been admitted to the program. He is someone who has gotten his bachelor's and master's degrees from NDSU. In addition to the PhD students, are always also able to complete a graduate college teaching certificate at NDSU by taking classes that also contribute toward their PhD. Brace yourselves, a new variant of Mirai takes aim at a new crop of IoT devices. Mirai, the variant Internet of Things malware that delivered record-setting denial of service attacks in 2016, have been updated to target a new crop of devices, including two found inside enterprise networks where bandwidth is often plentiful, researchers said this last Monday. A newly discovered variant contains a total of 27 exploits, 11 of which are new to Mirai. Researchers with the security firm Palo Alto Networks reported in a blog post Monday. Besides demonstrating an attempt to reinvigorate Mirai's place among the powerful botnets, the new exploits signal an attempt to penetrate an arena that's largely new to Mirai. 
one of the 11 new exploit targets, the WePresent, WIPG-1000 wireless presentation systems, and another exploit targets the LG SuperSign TVs. Both of these devices are intended for use by businesses, which typically have networks that offer larger amounts of bandwidth than Mirai's more traditional target of home customers. Quote, these features afford the botnet a large attack service, Palo Alto's network researcher Rucha Nigam wrote in Monday's post, referring to the 11 new exploits. In particular, targeting enterprise links also grants it access to larger bandwidth, ultimately resulting in greater firepower for the botnet for DDoS attacks. My takeaway on this is no matter how small the device, update, patch, and for heaven's sakes, use some decent passwords. <laughs> So Microsoft has announced a major expansion of its Azure IP Advantage program. Now, this particular program provides its Azure users with protection against patent trolls. Now, it also provides customers who are building IoT solutions that connect to Azure with access up to 10,000 patents to defend themselves against intellectual property suits. What is also part of the movement in this is was a donation of 500 patents to startups in the LOT network, the LOT network. Now, the LOT network is an organization which counts companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Netflix, SAP, Ford, GM, Lyft, and Uber, and more, and 400 members, and is designed designed to protect companies against patent trolls by giving them access to a wide library of patents from its members, companies, and other sources. Now, how far does this protection go? Well, it actually goes well beyond normal protections against patent trolls. Qualified startups who join the LOT network can acquire Microsoft patents as part of a free, uh, their free membership. Then the startups will be on them outright. Now, the LOT network will be able to provide its startup members with up to three patents from this collection. Now, there is one caveat, but it's definitely not a deal breaker. To qualify for getting the patents, these startups also have to meet a $1,000 per month Azure spend. Now, an additional focus in part of the patent set is IoT. Now, patent trolls have lately started to acquire IoT patents. So chances are they're getting ready and gearing up to move and start making patent litigation in this space in the near future. Now, this will hopefully be one way to keep those trolls under their bridge. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But first, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Now, I've used Wasabi. They're really awesome. They, you might be saying, well, cloud storage is really expensive. The more you store in it, the more times you pour, pour, perform operations on it, the more you pay. Well, in this day and age, that's the story for most cloud storage companies. Now, plus, uh, part of the cloud storage competition is to see how low your providers can go in the storage fees and the ingress and egress fees. Well, from experience, I can tell you, if you try and go to cheaper cloud storage systems, you also give up on performance and reliability. Well, Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage has a great way to fix all these things. Now, if you're doing small personal projects all the way up to the large enterprise ones, Wasabi seems to have figured it all out. Plus, listen to this game changer, unlimited free egress for your data. That, that means they don't charge you for API calls and you don't actually have to pay to access your data. Now go check it out right now, what you're already paying for cloud storage, because I can tell you not having to include egress fees and API calls for those CRUD operations will substantially save you money on the cost of doing business. Now, you're probably thinking, well, if they're cheaper, they must be slower, right? Well, that's not true. Wasabi has developed a disruptive technology. They found ways to pull raw performance out of their storage devices without compromising anywhere. They have a revolutionary process that lays data on disks sequentially as opposed to blocks. What happens? Well, that means that Wasabi storage is 80% cheaper and six times faster in speed than some of the industry leaders. Now, are you and your organization worried about compliance? I know some of them are. Well, Wasabi is HIPAA, FINRA, and CGIS compliant as well. Now, fast, cheap storage isn't worth much if your data isn't secure, right? Well, Wasabi has also an answer there as well. Wasabi offers a unique feature of immutable buckets that can't be deleted or altered, protecting your valuable data from accidental or malicious destruction. See if you can find another service that's doing that today. And plus, they also have a 90-day rotating integrity checks and 11 nines of durability. Now, if you're worried about data migration to the cloud, Wasabi also has an answer for that as well. They have a special appliance called the Wasabi Ball Transfer Appliance, and this thing has powered by Netgear and it's help, will help you to transfer large data sets while dramatically reducing 
your costs. Now, you already might have cloud storage or your organization probably has tried to store data on premise to save money or wants to move partially to the cloud. With Wasabi, it will have you rethinking those approaches. I bet you want to try out right now, right? Well, go build something fun and move some of your data right now. Experience Wasabi for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link and enter the code Enterprise. See how much storing in the cloud can save your business. That's wasabi.com and enter the code Enterprise. And we thank Wasabi for their support in this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's jump into the bites. Now, over the past decade or half decade, we've watched SpaceX and other organizations privatize space exploration in the advent of their plans to go to Mars. We have also dreamed about NASA getting back into the game. Well, as of March 26th, NASA is going to gear up some plans. Wait for it to go back to the moon. That's right, the moon. The thing is, it's only... That, that thing that's only 252 plus thousand miles away, well, why the moon? Well, it seems that this will accelerate the development of more advanced tech to assist in additional explorations in our solar system. And this includes highly advanced orbiting lunar gateway, a new, new set of spacesuits, and a lander that will allow the astronauts to visit and return from surrounding planets. Now, NASA aims to return astronauts to the lunar surface by 2028 as part of a campaign that would eventually prepare humans to visit Mars. Now, first test mission combining the space launch system, a huge rocket being built by Boeing and Lockheed Martin's Orion space capsule, expected last year, has been delayed all the way till 2021. So we'll have to see if they're able to keep all of their dates that they're calling out here. Well, first, I want to I want to throw this over to you guys because um, first I want to throw it to Schiebert because is, is NASA's way of saying uh, they need to build a sustainable architecture? Like, are they saying, hey, we need to... We're going to the moon again because we really just need to rebuild, uh, build a sustainable architecture to move forward. And then we can kind of go and explore other places, it's not just a race to the moon anymore. Right, Chubert? Yeah, the, the whole deal is we've only just visited. We have never set up any kind of long term presence other than the ISS. And the ISS is it's in orbit. So what we're what NASA has been wanting to do is set up a longer term presence someplace, preferably the moon, because that they already know how to get there. Um, they already have samples. They, they know what kind of chemistry is in the soil and things like that. So we've got a lot of people already working on things like how to 3D print lunar habitats. Well, the whole idea is once you're out of Earth's gravity, um, it's a lot easier to do a lot of things like get to Mars or get into the um, – you know, the asteroid belt. And once you start getting out beyond, you know, the, you know, Earth orbit, you start getting to the um, building materials for building really large things. Well, here's, here's my comment, though. I love the fact that this is happening. I think we're, we need to go back to the moon. The fact that we have lost the knowledge um, for the most part, on how to build and tune the largest engines in our inventory, the F1s, the ones that were used on the Saturn V. Um, we've lost a lot of that knowledge. Uh, the people that have passed away, those original engines were almost all custom-built and custom-tuned. So right. we need to get that knowledge back. But the big comment is, I'm sorry, this is not the Kennedy administration. This is not Camelot. We do not have a tame Congress. I do not believe the current administration has enough juice to pull this off. I agree with the goal, but I don't think they're going to make it. True. Uh, that's interesting. You commented. I want to throw this to Curtis because Curtis, the budget right now for NASA is quite substantial. It's twenty one point five billion. And as Cheaper said, hey, the Congress is going to be presented with a new uh, budget that includes an additional nineteen point nine billion. Uh, is that is this a way for them to catch up? Do they need more than that? Uh, do they need less than that? Is this is this is this a time for maybe the private sector to kind of blow them out of the water? Where do we think it's going to go? Well, I think it depends on exactly how they're going to do it. If we're talking about NASA building its own launch platform from scratch, uh, the $19 billion doesn't even begin to get them there. But but that would be a stupid way for them to do it. 
I think what it probably is looking for them to do is buy launches from one of the three uh, major sources of, of boosters, you know, SpaceX, uh, Blue Origins, and United Launch Alliance, um, which is mostly Boeing. Um, those are the three biggies, um, and each of them has either demonstrated or has on their planning books the very heavy lift vehicles that would be required to get um, a human-rated capsule into Earth orbit and then uh, to the moon. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> both uh, SpaceX and I believe Blue Origin have uh, put it as one of their goals to at least orbit the moon uh, within the decade. And I think that they are the likely people uh, to do it. Now, whether this is a good idea or not, uh, definitely yes. Um, not only because it's something that I think we need to do. And as a child of the 60s, I'm bitterly disappointed that we haven't already done. But it has a wonderful tentpole effect when our young people, when those who are interested in the sciences and technology and engineering, look at these big projects. It encourages them to be involved uh, in a way that many of the still very important, but less visually opulent projects won't. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, I live probably 40 miles or so from Cape Canaveral. And just a few nights ago, uh, Carol and I were returning from dinner. We hit it at exactly the right time. We got out of the car, looked to the east, and saw a SpaceX launch uh, just after dark. Um, it was spectacular. It was wonderful. It is a visually awe-inspiring thing. We need these big projects. Now, uh, if, if Putting a human being on the moon is all we're going to do, the same way we did back in 1969. Is it worth spending great huge sums of national capital on it? No. But for all of the other things that that could bring with it, uh, all of the add-ons, all of the drag-ons, all of the people who can be inspired, then I think this is absolutely something we need to do in a, as well as being a necessary next step um, on our journey to being a, a spacefaring race. Absolutely. Let's hope they can stick with their timeline because I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. Well, folks, let's go and jump into the next bike because we have a really interesting one. Curtis, I'm going to throw it over to you for talking about cybersecurity gurus. Yeah, and this is a cybersecurity guru that a lot of us haven't really thought about. Now, if you are a resident of Japan or North America or really planet Earth, the odds are good that sometime in the last year or so you've heard of Marie Kondo. Uh, you might have heard about her method called, oddly enough, KonMari, which is basically the happiness that comes through tidying up. Uh, this is the, the basic premise that we achieve greater joy if we live in an uncluttered, simplified environment. She is the guru for millions of people who have gone through their house following her advice to take each object that you come to, hold it in your hands and ask yourself, does this spark joy? If the answer is no, then out it goes. Only those things that spark joy remain, and then those things are put away very precisely and very neatly. The question that some people are asking is whether that is the same approach that, from a security perspective, we should be applying to enterprise data. You know, with the advent of the big data era, <clears throat> the urge existed for companies to save everything. Uh, why? Well, with big data analytics, perhaps 
they could derive value from that data in a way that they hadn't previously been able to do. Or even if the analytics capability isn't there today, perhaps at some future point, the data could be analyzed and, and it could bring value. Well, I had a chance to talk with a number of people this week, uh, including Grant Wernick, who's co-founder and CEO of Insight Engines. And he was really the one that first brought up this, this correlation to me. He said he had used it in conversations he's had with a bunch of CISOs and a bunch of CIOs with the, the trade-off of productive. You know, you, you would look at data and say, does this data bring value to the organization? Does it help us be more productive? Does it help us do something we couldn't do before? And if it isn't, then barring some external reason like regulatory requirements, get rid of it. A number of the security experts I spoke to uh, in support of the article absolutely agreed. And they said it's a real problem. As one person said, if you don't have it in the first place, it can't be stolen. He suggested that every company have a process, a procedure, and the will to get rid of a lot of the data that they've been holding on to. Now, I, I want to turn to my co-hosts. Um, Lou, first to you. What do you think about this? I mean, you work with a, an awful lot of applications that gather an awful lot of data. Do you ever think about what companies are going to do with that data after it's collected? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we have to think about this all the time ourselves. If, if we're going to collect some data, whether it's without PII or OII, we still have to think about whether we sh how long we should be keeping it, when it makes sense to get rid of it. Um, and so, and there's always specific circumstances to keep it longer than others versus less so much like for auditing purposes and so on. So it's always good for an organization to step up and, and begin that their data plan, uh, whether it's telemetry data or it's just customer data or user data. Um, what, what are they going to do for storage purposes? What do they need for auditing purposes? Um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and then decide on where and when and how they're going to store it is also very important. A lot of organizations tend to forget that as they say, hey, we're going to put it on ice cold storage, but we're not going to encrypt it. Or we're going to put it in uh, a data center. We're going to put it on, uh, you know, hard drives or disk drives that are in local, local organizations or local housing. And I think they have to really think about that from a going forward so they can scale out their plan and make it more secure. So I definitely think it's something that organizations should start thinking about, especially as we get more and more data each and every year for sure. Well, now I'm going to ask, you are, in fact, a resident of North America. Are you familiar with Marie Kondo? Is, is this the sort of analogy that you think makes sense? Or, or do you find this as something that's just a, a little bit, bit silly? <laughs> I am familiar, and I, I think it actually is a good analogy. I think it, it makes sense uh, to do uh, declutter what you need to declutter. I mean, the idea here is, you know, keeping on a data just for the sake of keeping on to it. Um, it's, it's not really a thing that you should be doing. You should only be keeping the data that you need now, uh, not what you think or you might need later. Um, uh, and, and in some cases, auditing data is something that you might need later. But again, it doesn't have to be um, something that would could uh, cause an issue or privacy security issue in your organization. So I think that's one thing that I think organizations really tend to have a struggle with is the difference between all of that. Well, figuring out that difference is where it really gets hard. Now, Brian, I know that you have spent time dealing with data of varying levels of sensitivity. Is the curation of that data, figuring out what needs to be kept and what can, uh, can be safely discarded, something that you have had to help organizations figure out how to do? You know, I actually, uh, I, I get to answer this with two different hats on. <clears throat> the old um, classified world, we actually had a lot of very set, very strict rules on data disposal, data archiving, and so forth. So we didn't, there weren't that many decisions. We just followed the rules. Now, <clears throat> switching to my academic hat, 
it actually gets even simpler. Um, as much as I love Marie's ideas, uh, academics don't throw away anything. Um, <laughs> I actually had to go and try and figure out how to convert data that was gathered many, many years ago from nine track tape. Um, so that kind of puts a, it into perspective that academics don't throw away anything. Um, it's actually to the point where I'm actually trying, trying very hard to get my uh, dean to go and let me buy a real honest to God data archiving system where I can archive to optics. Now, some of the folks in the chat room, you know, Rourke's basically said, yeah, hard disks are cheap. They are, but I've had hard disks fail even just sitting on the shelf. Um, what I'd like is I'd like to have some sort of way of archiving my data. So I'm trying to get my academics trained that there's online, nearline, and offline. And I want to go offline onto optical, something like Blu-ray, which is supposedly supposed to last 100 years at least. I, I don't think I'm going to have a Blu-ray player in 100 years. But we <laughs> tend to go and try and burn, especially our hydrophone data from our underwater observatory. We burn two copies. One copy is kept locally and then we take it off the spinning disk, and the other one's sent to a salt mine um, for long-term storage. Because unfortunately, a lot of this data that we're gathering is irreplaceable. So as much as I love Marie's ideas and you know so forth, I'm just looking around my lab at how much junk is piled up and thinking, hmm, she's got some interesting ideas. Maybe I need to go and make some time. Well, I certainly am no one to talk. I mean, for heaven's sake, I've still got data on 8-inch floppy disks around here. But I do think that her idea has has a lot of merit. And to the point of our, our uh, friend in the chat room, hard disks are cheap, but the cost of data loss is, is pretty darn high. So I think this, there's some interesting stuff here. This whole notion of curation is one we're going to deal with Again, in the future, I know I'm going to be looking at it uh, in the very near future at Dark Reading. Well, that's it for this bite. We've got a great guest coming up. And so, Lou, I'm going to pass it back to you to, to move us along in the show. Thanks, Chris. Well, before we get to our great guest, we have to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's WordPress. Something I love a lot is WordPress. I'm, I've been to developer conferences for WordPress. I've used WordPress for years. In fact, Leo has been using WordPress for over 12 years at leolaporte.com. Now, when you think of a blog or a site, for me, I always think WordPress. And even if it's for you or for your organization and you have something to say or you want to get something out there, WordPress is going to make it easy for you to do that. Now, I, when I actually have time to blog, WordPress is my platform of choice. I started out with a free trial with them, and then when and then the masterful using that masterful wizard they have there makes it easy for getting your custom site up in really just less than a couple minutes. If you're if you're like me, you like to browse all the options to add your site. So it took me a bit longer, but it still came out super beautiful, super easy to do. And it makes it really easy for you to spread the word. Now, over time, as the site grew, I actually wanted more complex theming components uh, and some support on how to do some of the more complex things. And I went ahead and paid for the business one. But it's so easy to switch and it's totally worthwhile. Now, WordPress is really easy to get up and running fast, whether it's your personal site or your organization site. They handle the complete spectrum of features. Um, from scale to creativity. And one of the most powerful features of WordPress is the plugin capabilities. Now, you want a social streaming plugin to ensure your posts and content are advertised on social media? Well, use a plugin. You now, if you want to get your word out, um, go check out this stat. WordPress is now powering 33% of the internet. That's right. One third of the internet is powered by WordPress. Now, there are millions of people and tons of large enterprise organizations powering their sites by WordPress. I actually been to some of the WordPress conferences where there's a ton of implementers, designers, and front end masters alike that attend and, and show you what the industry is doing with WordPress. They're, some of the, they're actually one of the most informative conferences I've been to. In fact, some of the most advanced front end developers and masters of design I know start using with WordPress and continue to use the platform today. Now, the great thing is this is a platform. So it's not just for developers and front end masters. If you have an idea or you want to get it out there, WordPress can get it started super fast. No two-week trials, no hidden fees. Your content is yours. You can download it at any time. If you ever have a question, well, they have WordPress experts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
they are the experts. They are just not just the normal customer service agents. They have the answer for you. They're the users, the content developers that will actually help you along the way. Now, with powerful site building tools, thousands of themes, 24-7 support, WordPress.com lets anyone pursue whatever it is they love by launching a site that's free to start with room to grow. Join the ranks of millions using WordPress each day to share their vision and views of their ideas. For you, our loyal listeners, we have a way to sweeten the deal with WordPress.com. Go to WordPress.com slash twit for 15% off any new plan purchase. That's WordPress.com slash twit for 15% off your new website. WordPress.com slash twit. And we thank WordPress for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it brings to that time of the show where we get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ryan. Today is no, no exception. We have Erica Brescia, co-founder and COO of Bitnami. Erica, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, drop in and drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Well, we, we're excited to have you here because there's lots, tons to talk about uh, because you're, you're obviously a very busy and impactful person. But we we have things like Linux Foundation, Bitnami, Kubernetes, and of course, your involvement in X-Factor Ventures. But before we do all of that, our audience loves the origin stories. Can you kind of take us through your journey in tech? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, it goes back quite a long way. I've been in open source for uh, 15 years now. Um, I met my co-founder and he was working on some really interesting uh, software packaging problems back at the time. He was basically ticked off about the solutions that were available on the market and started building out a tool called Install Builder. And I actually just went to join him for a month uh, in between jobs because I was really interested in a lot of open source work he was doing and how people were starting to build uh, businesses around what was free software, right? Uh, Linux at the time and a lot of open source companies were getting started. So I went to go help him out. I have a background in sales and operations and he's, you know, an engineer by training and uh, I never left. <laughs> that was 15 years ago that we really started working together. And uh, I've been on this journey of, you know, making software easier to package, deploy and maintain ever since. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a great segue into a good place to start here, which is getting organizations onto the cloud, making it easy for them. Um, but there's kind of a confusion what, uh, in this case, what Kubernetes is and what it can do for them. Can you maybe give us just a super quick primer on uh, what Kubernetes is and how can enterprises benefit from it? Sure. I mean, I like to think of Kubernetes as really a platform that allows people to adopt cloud native best practices, right? It's kind of a layer on top of your infrastructure that you can use to operate your applications. And it really separates the apps um, from all of the configuration and everything else that you need to run them and gives you a way to make things more portable. So, you know, Kubernetes is obviously an incredibly important technology. And I think the pace of adoption has surprised even its creators how quickly it's really <laughs> moved to become a de facto standard. Right. But for us, it's really about the way that it kind of changes the way that you operate software and the way that companies think about managing their uh, deployed applications. Makes sense. Yeah, I think that's interesting you said that because I think a lot of organizations are surprised with how fast it's kind of adopted. And I think there, there could be a couple things here. And one thing I'm wondering, I'm wanting to get your opinion on this is sometimes they think like, for instance, hey, Kubernetes is a PaaS or a platform as a service offering or <laughs> Kubernetes is a CI uh, mechanism. Um, is it you think it, the adoption is because they think it's more than it is or it actually is helping organizations kind of do what they need to do and scale their systems out? That's a great question. I think um, it's all of those things and none of those things at the same time, right? <laughs> I mean, there are several companies that kind of deliver Kubernetes as a PaaS, right? But it's really like an operations layer is how I, as a, as a non-engineer, I think about it. Um, mm -hmm. I absolutely think it helps. It, it helps force a lot of automation and best practices on companies because you just can't operate on Kubernetes the way you used to operate, you know, the server running into your desk, right? It's the whole pets versus cattle story, which everyone's heard a million times. So I won't walk us through that. But um, it, it really does kind of force an evolution in companies. I do think, uh, you know, 
people tend to um, kind of raise it up <laughs> on a platform that and not recognize the fact that Kubernetes is still really hard. And there aren't that mm -hmm. many people that actually have a lot of experience operating Kubernetes because it's so new. So right. yes, it can solve a lot of problems. It drives best practices. But it's not a piece of cake either, and it takes a lot of education and a lot of tooling, and it still requires a lot of effort uh, to maintain, you know, your Kubernetes infrastructure. And obviously, there's a whole slew of companies working on solving that problem for you, and all of the major cloud vendors now offer basically Kubernetes as a service, so you don't have to deal with that. Right. Now, you, you brought something up really interesting, I think, because a lot of organizations are trying to transition their applications or their offerings to the cloud and they want to be, make sure it's scalable. They can, you know, continuously update them, keep them secure. Um, I This kind of transits a little bit into what Bitnami does and how they can assist. How can they can potentially assist here and how are they helping? Yeah, so Bitnami has been in the software packaging and deployment and maintenance space for years, um, really since the cloud has come onto the scene. And, you know, from a user perspective, you can go to bitnami.com and we have a catalog of over 130 different uh, open source applications that you can deploy. You can download a VM, in fact, and, and deploy it locally. You can deploy on any of the major cloud platforms through their marketplaces. And we also deliver um, containers and uh, Kubernetes, um, basically deployment templates called Helm Charts. And actually going back to the sponsor that you highlighted, uh, we work quite a bit with WordPress, obviously, given that it does power 30% of the internet. So uh, we are partnering with them actually in releasing some really cool new WordPress cloud formation templates for coming soon on AWS. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you can get from Bitnami, right? You say, I want to deploy Jenkins or GitLab or um, or WordPress or Drupal, and you can go to Bitnami, get you know a cloud image or a Kubernetes template and a set of containers and deploy your application so you don't really need to understand how to package up software for any of these different platforms where you may want to run. Makes sense. Now, now IT is, you know, obviously organizations, IT organizations are already swamped with doing lots of things. And now they're kind of tasked with moving their applications from on-premise to the cloud. And that's where kind of containers get kind of in, mixed in there. Um, yeah. What do organizations have to do? I mean, I think, you know, you have an, you have an application. Uh, what do I do now? Like, where do I go? What's the next <laughs> step for me? So um, we're pretty pragmatic in how we think about these things. And what we see a lot of companies doing is first just moving apps into the cloud in the first place, kind of what you'd think of as a lift and shift. So they basically just take what they have and move it over. And then as a second step, they look at refactoring it. You know, if you're going to deploy an application in Kubernetes, um, you don't just take the entire app and all of its dependencies and shove them into one container, right? If you do that, you're doing it wrong. And there are plenty of people on the interwebs <laughs> that will tell you that you're doing it wrong. Um, you know, containers is really about separating out all of the different pieces and functions uh, of your application into different pieces that can be, they're kind of like building blocks that can be reused. Um, but again, we prescribe kind of a more conservative journey, like first just move your stuff to the cloud, then let's look at moving it to containers because it's not a, an incredibly simple process to deconstruct an application that was built to run in a totally different way. Um, and kind of rebuild it for containers. Now, Bitnami does have a tool for this called Stacksmith, which is our enterprise product that basically, if, if you think of what, about what Bitnami does, we have spent uh, years and years building automated processes for packaging up applications and delivering them on all these different platforms. And we've essentially productized that. So companies can either take existing Bitnami apps and apply their own kind of DevSecOps processes on top of it, you know, insert any kinds of um, agents or hardening scripts and things like that to the images, or they can use it to actually package up their own software. So if you have an application uh, that's maybe just deployed on a regular cloud VM and you want to containerize it, uh, Stacksmith can help you do that. You still do need to do the work to separate out the different pieces of your app um, if they're all kind of tightly coupled and you want to have a set of containers. We don't kind of chop that up for you. 
Got it. Well, folks, we have a ton more to talk about, but before we do, we do want to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Sophos Cybersecurity. Now, it's not news that organizations globally are worried about cyber threats, whether it's breaches or data leaks or privacy. Organizations are looking for a way to go on the defense. Now, it seems almost every day I'm hearing about another data breach or are affecting people. Well, now, what can one do about it? Well, Sophos Cybersecurity has evolved the approach in cybersecurity. They are using advanced artificial intelligence to detect threats before they strike. Now, imagine killing ransomware viruses or cyber threats dead in their track. Sophos uses deep learning to interpret data and respond to threats with little to no latency. Now, there are a ton of vectors of attacks. They are on the increase and more sophisticated each and every one of them. Well, this is where Sophos gets to work and make sure you're covered. You have, have you had any doubt here, there's actually a recent independent security test by done by SE Labs that has ranked Sophos number one in the best protection ratings across the board for both large enterprises and small businesses. Now, Sophos has provided advanced technology for millions of businesses worldwide for premium capabilities brought to both Mac and PC alike. And there's also Sophos Home as well. Now, I've actually used this. It's pretty fantastic. This brings real-time protection from ransomware attacks, malicious software, and hacking attempts and more. Now, don't think of this like any other home protection packages. It's incredibly easy to use. Even if you're securing your own laptop or managing the security of multiple devices in your home or around the world, you might think, well, if it does all these fantastic things, it must be tough to get it installed and deployed. Well, that's where Sophos prevails. It, the interface is super simple. It manages, man, you make, basically manage everything online, allowing you to secure your own laptop and manage and secure multiple devices in your home or around the world. You can sign up for a single account and protect all the Macs and PCs in your home from just a single console. And because it's cloud-based, you can use it and keep your relatives in check too and secure even them miles and miles away, thousands of miles away. You can even remotely manage their security, clean up threats, and keep their systems safe. Now, as you know, Sophos has a tagline, security made simple. So the whole thing is incredibly easy to use. Just log in from your browser and start securing your system today. Now, whether you're a home user or a large enterprise user, Sophos has you covered. In fact, some of the largest businesses in the world use it to protect them from ransomware attacks and that have really devastated a lot of companies and businesses last year and years before. Now, third-party reviewers constantly rank Sophos among the best cybersecurity providers. With synchronized security, you can manage all of your Sophos products with that single cloud-based console. Get a free trial today and or free security scan at Sophos.com. That's Sophos.com. And we thank Sophos for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we're talking with Eric Brescia, co-founder and COO of Bitnami. Thank you so much for being here. We were we talking a little bit about uh, Kubernetes and kind of the adoption of it. Um, we do have some more questions. I want to bring in my co-hosts as well because uh, they've also had some questions about it. And then we kind of want to talk about a little bit about the Linux Foundation as well as uh, your venture as well that you've been kind of involved with. But I think real quick, I do want to get your thoughts on, so we've seen where Kubernetes has been. We've seen how quickly it's been adopted. Where do you think yeah. it's going? Where do you think it will evolve uh, to and how will it help those organizations evolve as well? You know, for all the talk about Kubernetes, it still is really very early days. I think what we're going to see over time is companies being able to operate their infrastructure much more effectively um, and efficiently as new tools are developed to manage Kubernetes. I mean, there's still, if you look, there's, you know, a hundred different Kubernetes networking tools and monitoring tools and everything else. And I think over time, as as the industry matures, we'll see some consolidation and some clear winners emerge, and um, we'll see it get a lot easier to to adopt Kubernetes. And we're working on some projects uh, at Bitnami to help kind of further that that goal as well. Now, we always ask, yes, because I want we kind of constantly have a sway between whether organizations should move between FAS or functions as a service, VMs or containers. Like, what would you be telling people on how do they should decide and where they go first and, and where they move? I mean, the first question I always ask is, you know, what what's your goal? What are you optimizing for? And what does the app do? Because it really does matter, right? Like some applications probably will never be fully containerized because it just doesn't make sense based on how the application was written. Maybe over time it'll get replaced with something that's developed to be truly cloud native, but some things just aren't worth refactoring. Um, 
we don't see a ton of functions as a service yet, um, but it's I know it's certainly being adopted quite a bit um, for different specific use cases. We see a lot more right now and in, in stuff just moving to Kubernetes. One of the interesting things that comes up a lot too when you talk about functions as a service is lock-in, right? And for a lot of enterprise companies, um, they get nervous about going too deep on a particular cloud vendor and architecting their applications to be too dependent on specific uh, cloud vendor services. And obviously a lot of them have functions as a service offerings as well as Kubernetes as a service offerings. So as with anything, I think it's a trade-off to like how much efficiency and automation do you want to get and how much are you willing to offload to another uh, provider versus, you know, how much lock-in are you willing to accept uh, and control are you you willing to give up uh, in order to get any kind of efficiency benefit? So it really does depend. And it's not usually just a tech problem. You know, from my perspective, it's also a business problem. And like, what are you trying to solve for? Makes sense. Well, I do want to bring my co-host back in. Uh, I think to you first, Jeebert. So Kurt and I wrote a book on cloud computing. And one of the predictions that we made during in that book was that somewhere along the line, we're going to start seeing science fiction become science fact. And I want you and I to compare crystal balls here. Are we going to someday get to the point where a customer can take their containerized applications and start shopping it around to different cloud providers? Are we there yet or are we creeping up on that goal? I would say we're definitely not there yet, except in maybe very specific cases. Uh, Kubernetes does give you a lot more portability, but you do see each cloud vendor has its own solutions for networking, monitoring, all of these other things that you still need to take into account. And in fact, we developed something called the Bitnami Kubernetes Production Runtime, which is an open source project that kind of deploys a suite of best of breed tools in your Kubernetes cluster to try to give people a way to standardize the way that they're deploying applications across any different Kubernetes platform that they're running on. Um, but right now, if you're not using something like that, you're probably using the different tools and configurations that you need for each cloud platform. So um, I would say that that extreme portability is not really there yet unless you're you're using systems that have already been like tied together to be portable. Of course, over time, I do think we'll get closer and closer to that. And where we see the cloud vendors trying to differentiate is both in how they uh, build out and manage their relationships with customers. I mean, certainly some vendors are um, known to be uh, more supportive of their customers and engage more deeply than others. And they're all customers. So I'm not going to go and name which ones those are. But uh, most people probably have their own thoughts on that. Um, and then in different verticals, you know, and, and for different use cases, you know, Amazon may be less expensive than, than some of the other platforms, but they may not have some of the other features that say Microsoft or Google are, are building out. And Google obviously has that deep Kubernetes expertise and came in really strong on kind of the ML side of things. Um, so we see the cloud vendors trying to differentiate in different ways above the core uh, compute infrastructure. Um, and I think that's that's going to build over time some like workload gravity. Makes sense. Well, Kurt, I want to throw it to you because you, know, you have some questions about containers as well. I do indeed. And and mine comes uh, really around the, the notion of the Linux that we've been talking about. You mentioned the, the suite of... Um, apps and and utilities that, that you're bundling in the environment. And I'm curious, have you standardized on a particular Linux distribution that you use for all of your instances? And you know, if so, are you using one of the full Linux distros or, or have you chosen the one of the container specific distributions that many people are choosing to to build their containers on? Sure. Um, so the short answer is no. We haven't standardized on one. Uh, we do package most of our images and, and ship Debian um, because we find that to be very commonly used. But it really depends on the platform that we're supporting and the cloud vendor that we're working with. We also support CentOS. We've bought 
built RHEL images. We have our own uh, slimmed down Linux distro that we use that's Debian based that we use in containers as well because the other offerings that were out there just didn't really work for the applications that we were packaging. So it really depends on, you know, the, the platform that we're supporting. But Bitnami is pretty Linux uh, distro agnostic down to even, you know, if they're using YAM or APT, it, it, it doesn't matter. We can build for both. Well, it's it's nice to hear that that you allow for that um, flexibility in your your customers right now. Getting back to that whole uh, crystal ball thing, do you think that as we proceed and containers mature as a technology, uh, the trend is going to be toward a a single stream of container? Uh, oriented Linux distributions, or, or do you think the trend is going to remain one of allowing lots of flexibility depending on exactly which applications are, are being deployed? I think um, the Linux distro is becoming less relevant. Uh, I think people care less and less what's going in the container. In a VM world, people really care about which Linux distribution that they're using. And we've experienced that firsthand at Bitnami. And there are even companies like, if you remember our path, uh, that had built some really cool technology, but it was their own kind of Linux distro and nobody wanted to use it because people still really care what, what goes in a VM. In a containerized world, that becomes a lot less important. I mean, we very infrequently even get asked what goes into the containers. As long as they run and they have, you know, every library and everything that they need to run and they're as slim down as possible, people don't really care. I mean, now it's more about like reducing the attack surface, right? And and just making the containers as small as possible so they consume as, as few resources possible. So I really think people are caring less and less about the Linux distro. And I think, you know, uh, Red Hat's acquisition of CoreOS is a, a prime example of, of that or prime evidence for that. Um, and, you know, may have factored into why they chose to sell to IBM. So this helps kind of transition a little bit because I think we were talking about Linux and distributions. And I know that you're very closely involved with the Linux Foundation um, and kind of its goals and its visions, um, how they're kind of trying to build a sustainable ecosystem around open source. The interesting thing here is uh, kind of relating to Kubernetes and how organizations are taking utilization of it. Um, we've seen things like recently in the news about how Amazon was actually going and forking Elasticsearch and kind of using it in a sense where they were expanding it to do things that normally are charged kind of services for that. Um, and they were kind of almost taking advantage uh, to get make money off of the open source side of things. What do you think of that type of things from kind of thinking from the open source perspective of companies and organizations like Amazon doing that? Sure. Uh, and I've been at two conferences where this has been a prime example, as well as, you know, MongoDB's license change and certainly Redis's as well. Right. There's a lot of talk about this right now. Um, I am of the view that a lot of these projects came into being before the cloud was really a thing. And the license models and the business models that they chose didn't really contemplate the um, certainly not the like the fortitude of the cloud platforms and the popularity of them and how they would kind of change the game. So I think there are some companies that are in a really tough spot. Um, there's an argument that, you know, once you build an open source project and you choose a license, there's kind of an implicit uh, pact that you're making with users that you're going to continue to stick with that license and continue to make software available that way. Um, and I certainly understand that perspective, but I understand the perspective of the companies who are saying like, look, you know, you need to know what you're signing up for when you're using open source. And if people are signing contributor license agreements and, and turning over that right to the company, that company has the right to the legal right, certainly to, to change uh, their model over time. So um, I understand companies' perspectives on this. I also understand the view that Amazon... Um, believes that it's doing the right thing by its customers. Um, they took some um, bits, again, that were only available in the paid version of Elastic and, and offered them for free. And they say it's not a fork, but um, it certainly looks like a fork to me. <laughs> um, right. And and again, I, I, I kind of, I see all sides. I don't think ultimately that Amazon did anything wrong. I mean, they do give quite a bit back to open source. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I and I think they're in their rights to do what's best for the company, uh, their customers. It does. It feels kind of crummy when you have these, you know, smaller companies. Though Elastic's, you know, IPO'd, but um, right. when you have these smaller companies, where it might seem like there's the balance is off, right? Like these major vendors, and Amazon is is one example, but there have certainly been others that have tried to. Um, kind of subsume or or take advantage of open source projects. And it's going to require open source companies to evolve their models over time, is my view. And I, I do think there will be another license that becomes generally accepted that's still community friendly, but gives people a chance to build businesses around uh, open source software. I could talk Excellent. for hours about this, so I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there. One I think of my it's favorite great. topics it's right now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but we're, we, before we close up, I do want to give one chance to uh, for you to talk a little bit about because I think it's this super cool, uh, which is the X Factor Ventures. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved? Yes, I'd love to, and thank you for the opportunity. So, X Factor is a a fund. Uh, it's a seed fund that invests in companies with at least one female founder. And what's really unique about X Factor is. All of the investment partners, except for one, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, are women who have founded and scaled their own companies. And everybody but me, in fact, has raised quite a bit of venture capital. Um, but Nami is almost entirely bootstrapped. But um, so we have women who have been through this, who have scaled companies, who have got through those really challenging first few years of finding mar product market fit and building out executive teams and all those things. And we obviously... Uh, have access to great deal flow because we're out there in the community, you know, working with other women and meeting other founders all the time. And then we feel like we can add really unique value to these founders by helping them, you know, get through the, those first several years of scaling a business. Uh, we do have one token guy, Chip Hazard, who is, uh, has been in venture capital for, I think, 20 years now. And it was him and a woman named Anna Palmer that kind of got the idea to um, create the fund. And then it was spun out and it's still supported by Chip's um, kind of day job, which is uh, Flybridge, which is a VC firm. And our first fund was $2.9 million. We write $100,000 checks out of that. And we've made 27 investments to date across a whole range of different uh, industries. So it's been great for me because I've gotten exposure to businesses that I don't typically spend a lot of time thinking about given that I live in infrastructure, software, and open source. Um, mm -hmm. And we will have a new fund coming online very soon that's bigger and we'll be writing some bigger checks uh, out of that fund. And we have a bigger number of you know, female investment partners. So it's been a lot of fun. I think it's a great way to support more women entrepreneurs and you know, from a capitalist perspective, it's also a really unique opportunity for us to invest in these founders that are often overlooked, but um, by pretty much every uh, reporting metric you can get tend to outperform in the long run. Fantastic. Well, Erica, thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I do want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can go to learn more about Bitnami, where they can go get started, and as well as the X Factor Ventures as well. Sure. So go to bitnami.com. If you want the shortcut, go to bitnami.com forward slash stacks and you'll see our whole application catalog. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Erica Brescia and X Factor is at xfactorventures.com. So there you see the, the Bitnami application catalog. You can go on there, uh, get an app, deploy it wherever you like. You can even download it on your Linux, Windows or Mac laptop if you just want to try something out. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the Best Staying Enterprise podcast, according to 9 out of 10 Kubernetes replicas. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially my co-host in crime, starting with our geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. It's always great having you here, sir. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work? Well, I am on Twitter at ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. I am also Chibert at twit.tv, but you know, it's probably better to use Twiet at twit.tv so it hits all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you on what kind of topics you'd like to hear from. Uh, we've had some discussions with some of our viewers on how we're going to handle the new in-depth segments. Um, it's not going to extend the length of the show. We're going to use them more like tack-ons. But a lot of you have asked for more detail on more um, complex topics. So the first one is we're going to be working on VoIP troubleshooting. Fantastic. 
Thanks so much, Cheaper. Of course, we have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, where can the folks at home find you and all of your fabulous work? Well, like always, people can find my work over at Dark Reading. Uh, I've got a piece up today, the seven malware families that can ruin the day, week, or month of your entire IoT. Hope people will go over and uh, give that a look. Um, let me know what kind of technologies you'd like me to be looking at. Hit me up at uh, Twitter, at KG4GWA, or uh, you can send email to me over at Dark Reading. Um, I'm also trying to do more on Instagram for my articles. Uh, and next week, uh, I'm going to be over at Disney World uh, at a uh, InfoSec World. Uh, so if you're attending InfoSec World, um, look for me there. I'll be wandering around the Contemporary Resort seeing what kind of secure goodness there is to be found. And thanks, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You are the loyal listener that drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show and get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise news. So go out right now to our show page, twit.tv slash twy. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes that we have, plus all the show notes, co-host information, guest information, and the links to all the stories that we do to the show. But more importantly, next to all that stuff, next to the videos there, you'll get those helpful download and or subscribe links and support the show by getting your audio version, video version, or HD video version of your choice each and every week. It's really the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. So go ahead and subscribe. Now, after you subscribe, remember we should do this show live each and every week at live.twit.tv, 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Um, and of course, you're going to jump in and watch the show live. You might as well jump into the chat room live as well as irc.twit.tv. We get some really great questions from that. And you know, as you've seen, Chibert and I and, and Curtis took some there from there as well this week. Uh, and each and every week, we have some great people in there. Um, of course, don't forget to follow me at twitter.com slash lumm. There you get to see all what I do during my normal work week at Microsoft. Of course, you can check out dev.office.com as well to see all the latest and greatest stuff that you can do to, to extend Office and make it more productive for your organization and you. I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week to watch and listen and do this show. Um, and we really appreciate their support. I also want to thank all the engineers at Twit, of course, Thank you again to Mr. Brian Chi Gbert, who's also our tireless producer. He gets the guests. He books, does the plannings. He plans the shows. Without him, we really couldn't do this show. So thank you, Chibert. And again, before we sign out, we have to we have to thank our TD for today, uh, Alex. Alex, thank you for jumping in. Uh, you know the tradition. Uh, what was the major topic of today's show? I believe it was about Chibert fixing toilets, if I recall. <laughs> <laughs> It, I would say you're very, you're so close. You're so close, sir. I think today I think it was more around Kubernetes pods and more the way that that they basically help you uh, scale your organization. Oh, but course, yeah. but maybe next time, Alex. Uh, maybe also, next I'd time. just like to point out, uh, Kurt mentioned uh, the, the way that he stores. He still has data stored everywhere, and we also store our data on uh, eight-inch floppies <laughs> from time point. to time if we need to. So just <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it, um, uh, folks. Until next time. I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. <laughs>